Welcome. Today I'd like to speak with you about the findings of the Lancet 2024 Commission on Investing in Health. By the time you finish this session, I hope you'll be able to speak more confidently about the value of investing in health, review the importance of reducing premature mortality in different settings, and comment on key steps to achieving a 50% reduction in premature mortality by 2050. It's important to note that the 2024 Lancet Commission on Investing in Health was in fact the third such commission that the Lancet has had in the last decade or so. And the Lancet, by the way, is an extremely important British medical journal that's been deeply involved in global health and which for the last several decades has sponsored a number of commissions that have examined critical issues in global health and what might be done to most effectively address them. It's also important to note that these Lancet commissions um, on uh, investing in health, in a sense, have their origin in the 1993 World Bank annual report, which focused on investing in health and was really seminal and central to our thinking about how we might address the most important issues in global health. I encourage you, whether you're a full-time student of global health or not, to take a look at at least the executive summaries of each of these very, very important reports. The 2024 Lancet Commission report is based on the following premise, which I think is so important that I'm actually going to read it. That is that dramatic improvements in human welfare are achievable by mid-century with focused health investments. By 2050, countries that choose to do so could reduce by 50% the probability of premature death in their populations. Now, it's also very, very important to note that the Lancet Commission, in a sense, made the notion of premature mortality the organizing principle of the, of the report. Um, Many of our efforts in global health will focus on reducing child mortality. They'll focus on increasing life expectancy. But this commission has proposed to us that in a world in which we want everyone, everywhere, to live a long and healthy life, that we can come up with thoughtful, sensible, cost-effective, doable, and fair approaches to improving health by focusing on the notion that countries should try their best to reduce premature mortality, which we define as dying before the age of 70. And surely you'll realize that in some of the lowest income countries in the world, for example, a substantial share of the population will die before their age 70. By contrast, when we look at places, for example, like Japan, Singapore, Korea, Norway, a very, very small proportion of the population, a small proportion will die before they're 70. So once again here, they've used as the organizing principle the idea that countries should take measures to try to reduce premature mortality, defined as dying before age 70, and that it's sensible for the world to try to achieve a 50% reduction in premature mortality by 2050, and a 30% reduction in premature mortality by 2035. Now, you could and we could all say um, quite reasonably, well, what's, what's the evidence for this? And the commissioners have suggested that there's good evidence that these goals are not only desirable, but also sensible and achievable. First of all, when they examined the uh, last uh, five decades of experience, we found that 37 countries were able to cut their risk of premature death in half from 1970 to 2019. In addition, we know that a lot of the reductions in premature mortality were associated with declines in child mortality, and we know that those stemmed in many respects 
from what we can call technical progress, the development and dissemination of oral rehydration therapy, the development, uh, uh, use, and dissemination of new vaccines, for example, for pneumococcus and for rotavirus. And although there are enormous market constraints to the development of new diagnostics, vaccines, and therapeutics to address the health needs of uh, particularly of low-income uh, countries and the conditions that affect poor people in low- and middle-income countries, uh, nonetheless, the Commission was able to identify over 450 new diagnostics, vaccines, and therapeutics that are in the pipeline that could help to address the priority conditions that they outlined. So it, it, um, it's clear that there's a good evidence base for the suggestions of the Commission that the world seek to achieve a 50% reduction in premature mortality by 2050 and a 30% reduction in premature mortality by, was it, 2030. 20, the commissioners have proposed an approach that sits on, sits on six pillars, focusing on a small set of health conditions, using them to build a modular approach to strengthening health systems and achieving universal health care, a greater role for the public sector in the financing, acquisition, and distribution of essential medicines, reducing the risk of future pandemics, revising the approach to development assistance for health to focus on low-income countries, including the financing of global public goods and taxing tobacco. And what I'd like to do now is very briefly examine each one of these. We know from our study of the global burden of disease and risk factors that there are a substantial number of conditions that cause people to get sick, disabled, or, or to die and, and die prematurely. But we also know that in different settings, those conditions aren't equally important in uh, their share of the burden of disease and the extent to which they're amenable to being addressed by doable, sustainable, cost-effective, and fair approaches that we know are evidence-based. And what the commissioners have suggested is that the best approach, meaning doable, sustainable, cost-effective, and fair, I repeat, to helping to achieve the goals that they set are to focus on 15 priority conditions. Eight of those conditions relate to maternal health and infectious or communicable diseases, and seven relate to non-communicable diseases and injuries. This is really fundamental because um, many countries, particularly countries that are low and middle income, lack the capacity to address effectively a wide range of conditions. They may also lack the financing for it. But what the commissioners have suggested is they don't need to worry as much about all of these conditions because by focusing on a relatively small set of them, where uh, we know what can be done to address them effectively, these countries can take the fastest and best possible route to achieving the goal of reducing premature mortality by 50% by 2050. They've also suggested that the countries take a modular approach to universal health care. And here too, in a sense, what this means is focusing on those priority conditions and then within them examining what are the most important health system interventions that are necessary to most rapidly reduce premature mortality. So if we were worried about infectious diseases, for example, that concern children, clearly we would want to focus our attention on childhood immunization and then try to ensure that the countries have effective immunization programs that can deliver the most uh, important of the, of the vaccines for um, diseases that are vaccine preventable within children. And they've suggested taking this approach to each of the 15 priority conditions. They've also suggested that the public sector play a larger role in helping countries to ensure that they have essential medicines in the right place, in the right, at the right time, 
for the right people at the right prices. And they've suggested that this can be achieved better than it isn't being achieved now by a greater role of public financing, by bulking, centralizing, and pooling procurement, and by continuing to strengthen supply chains in order that those um, essential medicines that are procured can, again, get to the right people at the right time in the right places. There's an exceptional amount of evidence on the effectiveness of tobacco taxes, and the commissioners have highlighted the extent to which, in many regards, raising taxes on tobacco can do more to reduce premature mortality than any other single health policy. We learned from COVID, and I, I hope you've had an opportunity to see the video we did on COVID as the quintessential global health problem, but we've learned from COVID about the extraordinary downsides of a pandemic, the extraordinary economic, uh, social, educational, and health costs of a pandemic. And the commissioners have highlighted the importance of pandemic preparedness within countries and across countries. Of course, before they can rapidly respond, countries need to ensure that they have a plan for dealing with pandemics. They need to be sure that they have effective surveillance systems. They need to be sure they have effective mechanisms for communicating with the public, almost certainly in better and more effective ways than were the case during COVID. And then in addition to that, of course, they need, when they do respond, to carry out case detection and tracing, isolation, quarantine, ensure that the social setting is one that supports people who are doing this. Um, but again, um, we, we need to remind ourselves of the extraordinary costs of a failure to prepare for pandemics and a failure to respond to them. And we need to ensure we have both the political will, the political commitment, and the um, capacity uh, in place to prepare for these pandemics. And of course, this also has to include the ability to engage in the science needed to be sure that we can develop urgently new diagnostics, new vaccines, and new therapeutics if the need should arise. The commissioners have made some, in my view, very thoughtful suggestions about reorienting development assistance for global health. And here what they've done is suggest that such assistance should be oriented really in two directions. One would be helping the lowest income countries, those countries most in need of economic support for their health programs, to address the priority health conditions that they face in order to meet the goal of reducing premature mortality in half by 2050. But they've also suggested that an important part of development assistance should be focused on what we call global public goods for health. And that is those items that no individual country necessarily has an incentive to invest in, but without which we'll never be able to meet the goals that we've set for enhancing human health and trying to ensure that everyone can be all that they can be. So this includes things, for example, like reducing uh, um, the development and spread of antimicrobial resistance, ensuring that we have an effective pandemic prevention and response, um, sharing ideas on uh, best practices in global health. Now, we, we should also ask um, what countries will benefit from taking this approach? Clearly, uh, as I mentioned, the Norways, Koreas, Japans, and Singapores of the world have a relatively small share of their population dying before 70. And yet if they're to enhance the health and well-being of their population, it makes good sense for them too to focus on the reduction of premature mortality. That there's no question that even the best off healthiest countries will benefit by taking this approach. In addition, there are a number of countries, including for example, Egypt, the Philippines, uh, and Russia, which are middle and high income, but where they have unexpectedly high rates of premature mortality compared to other countries in their income group. 
And surely these countries will be, in a, be able to benefit substantially by taking the approach that the commissioners have recommended. And finally, it's quite clear that the biggest bang in terms of focusing uh, on the package of the six pillars that the commission report recommends will come to the, those countries that have the highest rates of premature mortality, which are most often found in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. In short, and this is so important, I'm also going to read it. This is, uh, the first part comes from the commission report. The second part comes from my interpretation of Professor Marcia Sen's notions of development of freedom. But that is, um, the case is better than ever for investing in health, for reducing morbidity and mortality, alleviating poverty, improving human welfare, and giving everyone the best chance possible to be all that they can be. So I compliment the members of the Lancet Commission. I thank them for the important report that they've written. I highly recommend that those of you interested in the study of global health or just in, interested in enhancing human health, take a look at the Commission report and think carefully about the notions that uh, have been suggested and how, if adopted, they might help us to move further and faster toward making the world a healthier uh, and fairer place. I'd like to end by thanking uh, Dr. Gavin Yami from Duke University, who played an important role in the commission and was very, very helpful in sharing some uh, information and documents with me to assist in my preparing this um, um, presentation. I'd like to thank Zoe Siegel, who's a senior undergraduate student at Brown University, who also assisted, and Belinda Plattner, colleagues at Yale University, who've done such a wonderful job and been such wonderful colleagues throughout the development um, and implementation of our course, Essentials of Global Health. Thank you very much.